Henry Das, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you today. We're going to be discussing entrepreneurial leadership and coaching others to success. And of course, as I'll share in your bio here in just a moment, you have an extensive background as an entrepreneur and as a coach and helping others. And so I think this will be a really rich and fun conversation. As we I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah. As we get started, I wanted to share Henry's bio with everybody. Henry A. Das started his first business in 1991, selling, installing, and servicing and financing computers to large corporations. Since then, he has founded a succession of firms in the e-commerce, finance, real estate, and consumer product spaces. For much of the past decade, he has taken his experience as an entrepreneur and used it as a platform to coach other business owners and founders. In addition, in, 19, in 2019, he self-published a book on everything you need to know about how to grow and manage your money. In his infinite leisure, he writes screenplays for fun, plays golf, travels when not on lockdown, plays Settlers of Catan with his three boys, and does other fun stuff. So such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think that's wonderful that you have those pastimes. Uh, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context before we launch on in? Um, no, that pretty much encapsulates it. Although I think I wrote that, um, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> so we're not on lockdown anymore, uh, which is actually, we just, I just drove 5,000 miles over the last two weeks all over America. So definitely not on lockdown. No fun, fun. I, I love road tripping. So, that, you know, one of my dreams is someday to get an RV and just travel the whole country. Um, I think that would be tons of fun. So lot, I saw lots of them on the road and my wife and I are talking about the very same thing. So yeah, well, very cool. Happen. So before we really launch on into the, the coaching side of things, uh, can you lay out for us a little bit of your history and trajectory as an entrepreneur? Uh, clearly you've, you've, uh, been heavily involved in the space, uh, in a lot of different industries and, and focusing on a lot of different types of entrepreneurial ventures. What got you into that space? Why did you stay in that space for so long? Um, and you know what what would you say to anyone listening who might be inclined towards you know an entrepreneurial spirit, but maybe has concerns about the the uh, the stability of it or or whatever? You know the reasons why people often go with a corporation instead of uh, starting their own business. What we call um, in the business entrepreneurs, right? And I've talked to a lot of them over the years. Um, and a lot of them are just not quite ready. Or what's even worse in some cases is they're getting ready to get ready. So um, I graduated college 40 years ago. Uh, this was uh, 1981. This was, so this, this year was our, my uh, 40th reunion, which was done virtually and was just a, 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 an excuse for a fundraiser. So I didn't even participate in it. Um, and I worked for, a, for like a Fortune 100 company, big, big, you know, gigantic company for about four years. And then I worked for a subsidiary of the New York Stock Exchange. So that was my, my those were, those were my 20s. And, I, and I'm the father of three boys who are in their 20s. And I tell them that your 20s are for experimentation, right? Uh, figure it out. Figure out what you want to do. Don't worry about making mistakes. You're going you're gonna to go down some highways and byways that don't work. But that's a really good time to do that. So I, I did that. I worked in, the, in what I call um, affectionately cubicle world. But I always knew in the back of my mind that I was not the personality type that was ever really going to going to be able to work for somebody else. Certainly not at that age. I was a little too much of a, of a maverick, a little bit too much of a gadfly, I guess. Um, but I also understood the value of using corporate America as a training ground. I mean, they'll, let's face it, they'll train you for free. So after you spent a ton of money and maybe gotten a ton of debt paying uh, the education system uh, for college, uh, it's, it's, it's time to, to, to turn it around a little bit. I let corporate America learn you up on a lot of stuff. And so that's what I did. And then I started my first business as a side hustle, which is, I would say, arguably, if you, if you look at the origin story of many entrepreneurs, it, it started that way. You know, a guy needed something. I call it uh, sometimes an accidental business. A friend of mine needed something, was having a problem. I said, yeah, I can do that. 
I made a couple bucks and then feed you more deals. Uh, that's, that's a very, very common story for entrepreneurs, much more common than the entrepreneur who has an idea, writes a business plan, goes out and raises a boatload of venture capital money and goes that route, even though that does happen fairly often. So, um, I guess it, to round it all up, I think it was my, my destiny, I guess, or maybe my calling. I don't know. One or the other. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And what would you say, you know, in terms of leadership style approach kind of mentality, what, what, what do you need as an entrepreneurial leader, as opposed to say, you know, someone in middle or upper management within a large corporation trying to lead a team? Well, um, the C-suite is a very, you know, tricky place because it becomes in many cases less about profitability, let's say, and it becomes more about maneuvering and positioning and the politics of it. So, you know, there's a concept called the Peter Principle, which you're your your listeners are probably familiar with, so I won't bore you with it. But basically, the it, it, and a log line for it to use the screenwriterly version would be that people people uh, ascend to the highest level of their incompetence, right? So when you get up in the in the C suite, it's more about fighting to stay there as opposed to get there. It's like a destination where entrepreneurship, um, the destination can be quite elusive. Um, I've asked a lot of people who pitch me on business ideas. The very first question on my mouth is what's your exit strategy? They're like, Henry, I haven't even done a nickel of business yet. And you're telling me how I'm going to get out. And it's like, yeah, because a ton of decisions that you make going in, uh, are going to be predicated on where you're going to, where you think you're going to exit. Are you going to, are you going, are you looking for a quick 18 month IPO? Uh, are you looking to be swallowed up by a competitor? Or are you looking to swallow up competitors, do a roll up, die with your boots on? I mean, there's a million different answers. Or do you want it to be your legacy and hand it over to your children who may or may not want to take over mom or dad's business? So there's a lot of questions that you need, you need to answer. It's a little bit like when you wage a war. Right before you go into a foreign land, and we just exited Afghanistan after 20 years. Uh, before you go in, you got to figure out how am I going to get out? And people make that mistake over and over and over again. And what they end up doing as entrepreneurs is creating a job they can't quit. Right. And I've even met people who not only are, have they created a job they can't quit, but they're not even paying themselves. Right. Oh, everything's great with my business. The only downside is I haven't drawn a salary in the last eight years. I've actually <laughs> heard people say that. <laughs> it's a head scratcher, I have to tell you, but people do it. Yeah, yeah, people right. do do it. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you raised some important points. And and I, I find it interesting, too, like uh, leading an entrepreneurial startup. Um, you know, things are lean, you're trying to bootstrap. Uh, it does, it does depend, like you said, on your, on your motivations. It depends on your goals and your trajectory and what you're, you know, hoping to accomplish and when. Um, but you know, most, most, um, startups, you know, you're bootstrapping and you're trying to get by and you, and you have a lean staff and, and you're trying to build over time and, and do it in a scalable way. Um, that, that's a bit of a different thing. I mean, it's, it's really fundamentally a different thing than mm -hmm. being a middle manager, you know, within a corporate system. Um, and so, you know, it really does take, uh, not necessarily a different skill set, but it takes attention to a different set of details, right? Different context, I suppose, um, when you're in that kind of a space. And, and frankly, let's be honest. I mean, that's, that's where most leaders are. Something like 80% of employees in the U S work for small, um, companies, sure, right? Sure do. And yeah. so, you know, most people work for people, in small companies. And so when we're talking about trying to enhance the experience of employees in the workplace and having better leadership, honestly, we, we usually focus on the big corporations. We focus on the Googles and all the tech companies and such. But you know where the rubber meets the road and where it's going to impact most people is in these smaller businesses and in these startups. Uh, so we need to figure out how to do that more effectively and how to be more you know, sustainable, more proactive, more people centered as an entrepreneur trying to lead a business, uh, run a business, uh, perhaps 
you know, in a, in a context where leadership isn't your background, it's not your, you know, it's not your focus. You're, you're a, you're or a product. It, it doesn't come naturally or to it doesn't you. come naturally to you. Right. right. You maybe, maybe you're great at coding. You come up with a great, you know, app or, or you have this idea for a product or service or, or whatever. A lot of times you don't necessarily have that inclination towards leadership. And so what, what would you say to anyone, um, you know, who finds themselves in that boat, trying to, trying to be effective, trying to be, create a sustainable business, um, but also recognizing the gaps and recognizing maybe they don't have all of those competencies yet. They have to develop them. One of the things that, you know, the businesses are, are hierarchical, right? It's like a pyramid. So you as the entrepreneur may be sitting in that rarefied air at the top of the pyramid. So I, I often I've suggested to people is to just reframe that and flip the pyramid upside down. And look at it as, as you being more like Atlas holding this pyramid on your shoulders. Your job as the leader is to support everyone else who's doing the work, not vice versa. Uh, if you are not a natural born leader, and I think that there are some people that are, you can still, I hate to say fake it, but you can still gain the skills that are necessary if you're motivated. But if you're, if you're the, the, the worker, right, if you're not necessarily the entrepreneur or the leader, and you just kind of want to be in your little cubicle doing your thing, a leadership role just may not be in the cards, which becomes a bit of a paradox because you're the, co you're the founder or the co-founder and the owner, but you're straight out of central casting. You're that, you're that guy who's off in the corner spinning his little stuff. Um, he's the genius, he's the, he's the visionary, he's the worker bee, but he's not the guy that people are going to rally around. You know, I think of early Apple because my first business was as an Apple computer value-added reseller, that first business that I founded in 1991. And I think about Steve and Steve, right? And you basically had Wozniak as the, the sort of geeky guy doing the stuff and kind of leaving the business to, to Jobs. And Jobs was the, was the evangelist. He's the one out there with the turtleneck, changing the world, right? They, they made a, a, really, a really nice pairing. Um, and there's a lot to be said for going out and finding co-founders, finding people who complement you because somebody has to lead. A leaderless company is not a company that is going to be sustainable over the long term. I would, I would argue that even a bad leader is better than no leader at all. Although I should be careful what I wish for with that one. Um, but yeah, people want to be led. They just do. There's only one thing that you need to be a leader in this world, and that's followers. And people want to follow people. They just do. 90 plus percent of people are looking for somebody that they can follow. Right. So if you imagine yourself as this leader, even with all of your shortcomings, and if you're willing to take your lumps, uh, a lot of people when they're in that, in that, you know, go fast, break things, you know, the, the, that sort of Zuckerberg meme uh, where entrepreneurial start, they tend to be bullies. They tend to think that if they just bully people, that that's leading them. And then they'll find out experientially that no, all that does is make people afraid of you and make people quit, right? Your good people are going to quit because nobody wants to work for a bully. And then you, and that's okay if you do that, as long as you learn from it and understand that there is a much subtler, much more nuanced way to lead people. Those are the ones who rise to the top and can do that and, and really be successful. And you need coaches and advisors and mentors and whatever to help you sand off those rough edges. Um, yeah. Just and I, do. I think we all have those rough edges, right? We do. Um, and I, and I, I like you, I believe that there are some people that just seem to naturally have that emotional intelligence, that empathy, that authenticity, the ability to connect with people and to influence people you know, to, to lead them towards, you know, whatever it, it could be a business, it could be, you know, a community thing, it could be whatever, but, you know, some people seem to be kind of naturally drawn to that. Um, but that doesn't mean that 
all the rest of us, and I, I don't I don't include myself in that group. Um, that doesn't mean that all the rest of us can't learn how to do it, and that we can't sure. practice it, and that we can't develop into it and grow in our competencies and capabilities. And so that does then lead to the the coaching um, aspect, the, the the ongoing development uh, aspect, and that starts fundamentally with uh, just a willingness to practice critical self-reflection, to look to int be, practice introspection, to look inward and to try to figure out what's working, what's not working. Um, have an interaction with an employee. You know, you have something in your mind of how you think it's gonna go, it doesn't go that way, something happens, think about it uh, and try to figure out how you can approach that differently next time. And a lot of times if we don't have good mentors and people around us to, to bounce ideas off of and try to unpack all of that, then we, we don't know what we don't know and we don't know how to address those gaps. And that's why coaches come into play. That's why people uh, who can help facilitate and walk you through that developmental process, that self-reflection um, is, is really so important. Um, so maybe talk to us a little bit about how you approach that when you work as a coach with entrepreneurs uh, and try, helping them trying to think through all the aspects of the business. I mean, leadership being one component of that, but thinking through all the aspects of the business and ultimately how to be successful and achieve the goals that they've set out for themselves. Well, one of the things we talk about is a coach approach leadership. So you as the leader, think about the fact that you're being coached by a coach, but you now need to, to translate that and coach your people. There are skills and techniques that you can learn. You can learn mirroring as an example. Uh, which is a really, really, and I've, I've gone through it with more with my, my wife of 30 years, uh, going to various seminars and stuff like that to learn the techniques, which is really just a listening technique. Uh, that I think anybody can learn, whether you think you're a natural leader or not a natural leader. Uh, there's something that I call the, uh, the sandwich methodology, of um, imparting criticism, which is you know, not something that I created. You start with something positive, then you put the, the, uh, the criticism in the middle and you always end with something positive. That's something that I learned, you know, coaching Little League, right? Because uh, you got to soften them up and then you, you come in and, and be careful with your pattern language. Understand that, that there are you know, words that activate people's amygdala, right? They just do, and they'll put them on the defensive. I've, um, you know, I've, I've talked to, you know, lots of different people when they have difficult, uh, you know, clients, when they have difficult conversations with, the employ with a, an employee uh, or sometimes, a, a, you know, a partner and say, listen, give them the home field advantage. Don't drag them into your office and say, close the door. Right there, you might have lost them, right? Go find a neutral place or better still do it in, in a place where they're comfortable, allowing them to become a bit more unguarded before you have to have a difficult conversation. Um, because in essence, that's a, a lot of what you're doing in, in business is just solving problems and having difficult conversations. If everything's kumbaya and zipping along, what, all you got to do is cash the checks, right? But who runs a business like that? I, I haven't met anybody yet, nor have I always going to be these challenges and remind yourself you know, early and often that people do want to be led but you can't lead them by bullying them you, you have to gain their trust and their respect so think about it what do you yeah. do with anybody to gain trust and respect right? yeah th that's a, a really really important point and a lot of people who progress within an organization, you know, they move up the hierarchy in a, in a traditional corporation. Um, a lot of them tend to think like they are owed that respect. Uh, they are owed that trust due to their position because they've been successful. That's why they've moved up. You know, they have the experience. That's why they've moved up. People should defer to them. People should look to them and they just feel like that's the way it should be. Um, and I'm sorry to break it to you, but that's not the way it works. I don't care if you have 30 years of experience and you're a brilliant person, um, you still have to earn that respect and that trust. And, you know, if you have a lot of experience and you, you have good people skills and you're able to communicate with people, you'll develop that trust quickly. Um, you know, I think people by default tend to be, you know, trusting of, of people in positions of authority. Um, 
but we, we still have to earn that. We can't just take it as a given. We can't take it for granted. It has to be something we're continually working at. And so like I am thinking right now, I have a team of people I work with. I think they trust me. I think they, they believe that I genuinely care about them. I believe that um, they will look to me as someone um, that they can follow. But just because that's the way it is right now doesn't mean that's the way it'll be in six months from now. Um, if I completely let go of those things that I am doing consistently to build and maintain that trust over time, if I stop doing that stuff and I and then I start treating people badly or I start micromanaging or being a, you know tr using this kind of power control method of leadership, that is going to erode all of the good faith and trust that I've built with these people, even though currently I think I'm in great shape with that. Um, and so this is something we have to pay attention to. We can't ignore, and we have to continue to pay attention to it uh, to create sustainable relationships of mutual accountability and trust. And so people know that I, I do have their back and I am looking out for them and I am trying to help them be, to be successful. And in fact, how I drive success for me and my team is through helping them to find su personal success and, and success in the work that they're doing. Uh, you know, I, I, I get that nothing I'm saying is revolutionary. This isn't rocket science. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard other people say this before, but it, it, it's worth repeating and it's worth reminding everyone about re over and over and over again because so many leaders do this very poorly. And it, it has nothing to do with their intention. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're like a cruel, horrible boss. But if you're not paying attention to this and giving, you know, making it a priority, then inevitably you will undermine your relationship and your ability to lead your people. The trust will be eroded and you won't be as effective as you otherwise could be unless you're paying consistent attention to it. And you'll, and you'll lose your good people. Uh, there's a lot of, um, of um, negative consequences to, to not being mindful. Um, you know, I've been to a zillion seminars and, and conferences, you know, back when you could still meet in person and listen to tons of talks and podcasts and uh, whatever. And the way I look at it is uh, if I get one nugget out of it, then it was worth the time. That's all I'm looking for. The bar is very, and sometimes that nugget is something that I already know, but I've forgotten about. So that's why we talk about mindfulness. It's very, very easy to fall back into old habits or bad habits, especially when you get triggered, right? You get a, you get a call from a disgruntled client, right? And you fall into this sort of primitive lizard brain mode where um, you want to lash out right you think and you may be and you may be justified it may be totally unfair what someone is saying to you but sometimes as the leader you just got to suck it up you just got to take your lumps um i think another important characteristic with leaders is understanding when it's time to be a follower right if you want to be a coach approach leader there are going to be times where you are going to have to empower and enable somebody and, and in many cases, allow them to fall flat on their face by giving them a, a leadership opportunity and not micromanaging it and not second guessing them or Monday morning quarterback them, right? Yeah. How do we learn? We learn by doing stuff and by, you know, we go through, most people go through 17 years of schooling. They don't get every question on every test, right? I don't know a single person, even the super smart people that I know who have ever been able to accomplish that goal. And the ones that tried to make that a goal made themselves crazy by the perfectionist <laughs> side of things, right? Let's not do that. I'm not saying to go out and, and uh, embrace failure or even get used to it. It should be uncomfortable, but you have to put that into, you know, it's another arrow that you put into your quiver. Okay, I understand. I might have screwed that up. Let's think about, let's do a postmortem of that and think about how, when that situation arises again, which it most assuredly will, whatever it is, how am I going to do it better? And eventually those people who never thought of themselves as a leader, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I'm leading people and they're following me. Actually, I have respect and I have agency. Where'd that come from? Right? All of a sudden it washes over you. It's pretty astounding. 
Uh, it really yeah, is. Yeah. Well, very well said, Henry. Um, I'm, I'm just noting the time and I recognize we're getting short on time. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a really fun conversation. Before we close, I want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. So the easiest place to to um, to find me is, you know, my my personal vanity site, Henry Das, A-G-N-R-Y-D-A-A-S dot com. Even if you misspell it with, with one A and two S's, you'll still get there because I'm a little anal about stuff. Uh, and it has my, my, uh, my coaching site and my, and my book. You can, you can download my book, FQ Financial Intelligence, for free. Right? I give it away. The only one who makes money on books is Bezos. And last time I looked, he's already got enough. Um, and it has all sorts of other stuff, my screenwriting and my baseball card collection and my settlers of Catan boards, you know, all the various stuff that I'm interested in. And you'll get a pretty good understanding of what makes me tick. And if you want to talk, go to my coaching site, click on the little button that says, get my help. Happy to talk to people, no charge, no obligation. It's what I do for a living. Yeah, wonderful. Well, and I have to ask, because you just mentioned your your baseball card collection. Uh, what's your favorite card, your, your greatest treasure? It's probably right behind me. I don't know if people have, uh, um, if they watch the video or stuff, but I'm a Roberto Clemente fan because I grew up in the 1960s and he was always my hero. Um, and so what's what's on the wall behind me is are my um, my entire collection of Clemente cards from his 55 rookie card up to the last one from 1973. And um, the holy grail of baseball cards for a guy like me is the 1968 tops 3d roberto clemente there were only there's only like <laughs> 10 known in existence right and one of them sold not not too far um for about 50 grand that's my holy grail wow. if i ever went yeah. out and bought that my wife would divorce me but, uh, <laughs> i've well, only seen one with my own eyes at a card show <laughs> and i was dumbfounded with gobsmacked by that so yeah well great <laughs> nice, thank you nice thank to you. dream yeah, thank you, Henry, so much. It has just been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Henry can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.